please join us um, in the music bulletin or in the music screen to God of Wonders. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. Good morning. Disarm. Uh, welcome everybody. There's a few stragglers out in the back. We have no excuse because it's not. There we go. We have no excuse because it's 932. And uh, thank you for the music this morning. Uh, and uh, my name is uh, Pastor John Hoffmeister. I'm assistant pastor at Christ Memorial Lutheran Church uh, in Malvern. Uh, some of you may uh, have been here when I've been here before. Uh, I'm, I'm missing Pastor Mockery as you are. Uh, there's a pastor's conference this week, and uh, he's not going to be there. Um, so, uh, um, but uh, I trust he's having a good retirement. Uh, I think pastors never really retire. He may be taking a break for a little while, but something tells me he's going to be back in. Um, but uh, I want to welcome everybody to worship this morning. And uh, I ask that everybody please rise.
We begin this morning in the powerful name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all of your sins. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of the kings, to open doors before him, that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes of secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my son, my servant Jacob, and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that the people may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you, God. Our epistle lesson this morning is from Thessalonians 1, the first chapter, beginning at verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you, may, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, 
and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord. second chapter. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his talk. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. He said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Please be seated. It says, signing of the fellowship record, I don't have a script, so I assume you all know what to do. <laughs> Of all the children would like to come on up for the children's message. Now, would the board please do that? How are you today? Help other people, yeah. What else? Huh? Yeah, money, right? So it's when people in the church give money to God in the church so that we can reach more people and share the good news with those around us, right? It helps the building, it helps new ministries. There's lots of people in the church who pray about it and decide what to use our offerings for. But ultimately, it's so that more people can know about Jesus. And today, in our Bible reading, Jesus was asked about money. And the Pharisees were trying to trap him. They were trying to trick him. There's this thing that we have to pay, it's called taxes. And they're like, do we actually have to pay these to Rome? Jesus said, give to the government what's theirs, and give to God what is God's. What do you guys think about that? What is God's? What, what does God own? What belongs to God? The earth, right? <laughs> everything. Everything belongs to God. God created us all. Did you know that you belong to God too? We are all his children, right? We're made in God's image. God created each and every one of us. So, <clears throat> when we give offering, does it have to be just money? Can we give other things to God too? Yeah, right? What else might, might we be able to give to God? Do any of you have special talents? You play the drums? 
Right. You can use that to give God glory, right? You're also athletic, right? You can use that to give God glory. What about you guys? You can be good friends, right? Do any of you like to dance? Not really? That's okay. But there's all sorts of ways to give glory to God that we can use as offering also. So there's time, right? People who volunteer, the people who helped us with BBS, who teach your Sunday school, that's giving offering to God too. And so I want us to practice today. So I've got each of you a coin. We have a part in our service where we have the opportunity to give a little bit of money to God. So I want you guys to take a quarter. And when the offering plate comes around today, I want you guys to put it in there, all right? Awesome. Okay, let's hold our hands, bow our heads, and talk to God. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving us so many blessings. Help us to remember that we are your children. Help us to use our time, talents, and treasures and our gifts to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks, Betty. Please rise for the sermon. <laughs>
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word this morning given to us through the Holy Spirit. But especially we thank you for the grace that we have received through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. I now ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds, open our eyes and our ears to the words which you have prepared and free our hands and feet to worship you with deeds that you have prepared for us since before creation. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture lesson for our meditation this morning is taken from our gospel reading. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to talk about government. Boy, could I rant and rave about this one. We could get good and riled up here on this Sunday morning, couldn't we? Let's take a look at our scripture readings first, shall we? We join the gospel story this morning during Passion Week. Now, none of the participants knew it was Passion Week except for Jesus. Earlier in the week, he, Jesus, rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to loud hosannas and praises of the people. Now, the people were looking for a Messiah, but in the form of an earthly king. That's how they saw Jesus. And pressure was building for the religious and political leaders to take care of this Jesus problem. And he was a problem for them because he was challenging their religious and political power. And they ultimately did find a solution. Gospel of John records the following after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. And one of their plans was to find a way to trap Jesus in his own words. So enter today's gospel reading from Matthew. While the Pharisees were one of the groups of religious leaders of the day, the Herodians were more of a political group whose beliefs resembled the Sadducees, another group of religious leaders. They encouraged the idea of a national kingdom under the rule of the Herodian dynasty. King Herod was the Tetrarch of Galilee, or more plainly, a puppet of the Roman government, and he and his brother Philip ruled two of the four Jewish provinces, therefore the Herodian dynasty. King Her or, or, so we have both religious and political leaders confronting Jesus in our gospel reading today. St. Luke puts it a little more plainly. So they watched him and sent spies. First, they started with flattery. They said, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. The interesting thing is, everything they said up to this point was absolutely true. But Jesus saw right through this flattery. Tell us then what you think, he, they continued. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they tried to set a trap for him. He was surrounded by the people and representatives of the government. If he said yes, the people would turn on him. After all, the Jewish people were the chosen people of God and not meant to be ruled by the Romans or anyone else for that. If he said no, 
The government authorities would report to Herod and he would have his head chopped off just like John the Baptist. Interesting trap, isn't it? But Jesus saw right through this one too. He answered by saying neither yes or no, but more simply, yes and yes. His answer, very plainly, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And scripture reports that they marveled at his world, words and then went away. But Jesus sets an interesting precedent and lesson for mankind and Christians historically and for us even today. What are our responsibilities when it comes to our Christian citizenship in this world? The Pharisees and Herodians asked this question to trap Jesus. We ask this question to find God's will. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That sounds okay in theory, doesn't it? But how do we put this into practice today in this world and in this culture? The world and culture has certainly changed over the past hundred years, the past 20 years, even the past five years. The attacks by our government and our cultures and the world on moral and Christian behavior have intensified significantly. More and more, Christians around the world, as well as here at home, are being persecuted for their faith, often by their Muslim and secular governments. And it's getting worse each year, and it looks like it will continue to do so. Muslims are persecuting and killing Christians throughout the world with little, if any, resistance at all. In Europe, Christianity is all but gone, and Islam is taking over. In fact, Islam has spread further without force against the vacuum of complacent and dying Christianity than it ever did by force during the time of the Crusades. In the Americas, seemingly the last stronghold of the Christian faith, the church is increasingly coming under scrutiny and persecution not necessarily from governments or other religions, though that is growing, but from a godless culture that is rotting our society from its foundations. The time of the church is seemingly over. But this shouldn't surprise us at all. Jesus told us that this would be coming. We've been living in comfort and spiritual laziness as a culture for far too long. I heard a pastor say once that the problem with the church in America is that nobody is trying to kill us. So how do we put what Christ commands into practice today in this world and culture and in the coming persecution? Again, scripture takes this apart for us and explains it very clearly. God calls us to be good citizens to pay our taxes, and to obey our governments. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul writes the following, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. This is Paul talking. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of the conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed, 
Owe one, no one anything, and this is very important. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, Paul wrote all of this during the time of Roman rule when Christians were being persecuted, often at the point of a sword, hungry lions, and other unspeakable tortures. Hardly what we're facing today in America, but what many Christians are facing around the world. So it is very applicable to us today. In Paul's letter to Titus, he writes, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. Boy, that's so hard with our leaders today. To avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. I don't know about you, but I'd like to see a little bit of all of that in Washington. In 1 Peter we read, be, sub be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's what St. Peter said. You see the trend here? God has instituted government, the concept of government. But just because a ruler or emperor or king or governor or president is bad, doesn't mean that government is bad. God has placed government and those who govern over us. And God gave us responsibilities as citizens, as outlined in the scriptures we have just read. Now, if God has placed government over us and we are supposed to obey our leaders and governments are often not good, <laughs> As Christians, what are we supposed to do? How now shall we live? Well, aside from the scriptural guidance we have already heard this morning, St. Paul adds the following from his letter to Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. This is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. St. Paul makes two powerful points here that must guide us, love and prayer. First of all, we are to be evangelical. Our loving God desires that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth that is salvation in Jesus Christ. That must be our driving force as Christians. To love our fellow man and woman, to love even our enemies, so much so that we would want to see them gain a saving knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ. The driving force of our behavior should be the growth of the kingdom through our love for God. Our love for our fellow human beings, all human beings, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And how do we accomplish this? We begin with prayer. We're to pray for our governments, pray for our leaders, those in high places. And we are to pray for our enemies. I read an interesting comment on this topic. It's from a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. It's a little long, so bear with me. So what does it say about our churches today that God birthed the church in a prayer meeting? And prayer meetings today are almost extinct. 
Am I the only one who gets embarrassed when religious leaders in America talk about having pap prayer in public schools? We don't have even that much prayer in many churches. Out of humility, you would think we would keep quiet on that particular subject until we practice what we preach in our own congregations. I'm sure that the Roman emperors didn't have prayer to God in their schools, but then the early Christians didn't seem to care what Caligula or Claudius or Nero did. How could any emperor stop God? How, in fact, could the demons of hell make headway when God's people prayed and called upon his name? It's impossible. In the New Testament, we don't see Peter or John wringing their hands and saying, oh, what are we going to do? Caligula is bisexual. He wants to appoint his horse to the Roman Senate. What a terrible model of leadership. How are we going to respond to this outrage? In Acts 4, when the apostles were unjustly arrested, imprisoned, and threatened, they didn't call for a protest. They didn't reach for some political leverage. Instead, they headed to a prayer meeting. The apostles had this instinct. When in trouble, pray. When intimidated, pray. When challenged, pray. When persecuted, pray. I want us all to remember this morning. Let love and prayer guide you in these difficult and ultimately dangerous times. And did you notice? There's nothing political about all of that. God is above all politics. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of our salvation, you deliver your Son's work through your Word in power and in the Holy Spirit. Strengthen the church's pastors to proclaim your truth. Increase the faith of all who hear that they may respond in love, steadfast in their hope. Lord, we pray this morning for the call process of this congregation. Lord, we pray for the um, for the pastor who you know is going to be called to this congregation but may not know himself yet. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit uh, would be empowered here and in that pastor's heart, Lord, and that this congregation would continue to have hope and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all truth, from the rising of the sun to its setting, you make known your salvation in Christ. Bless fathers and mothers as they teach their children your word and your ways. Let them know that there is no God besides you, and so rejoice in your faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy. God, our Father, you appointed Cyrus as your instrument to return your people to Jerusalem. Uphold the authorities of our nation in wisdom and integrity, that we live, we might live in peace with a good conscience. Grant that they would make salutary use of the taxes we render, and lead us to recognize them as your instruments, honoring them as you command. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our help comes from you, who made heaven and earth. 
You preserve our life. Have mercy on those who are afflicted and especially those who we now name before you silently in our hearts. Keep them from all evil and shade them from all harm. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, guard those who travel. Keep their going out and their coming in. Protect them from every trouble. Prosper their journey according to your will. And make their homecoming joyful. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. True and living God, you have turned us from idols to serve you and live. As we await your Son's return and glory, grant that we would faithfully receive him at this altar with repentance and joy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. and in all places. Give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Peace of the Lord be with you.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. so that he might bless the people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It says announcement so that it's shown there. Well, the first thing I want to do is apologize to the organist for telling her that I don't chant. <laughs> I'll remember next time. <laughs> Did you give it up for one? I gave it up for one. You don't want to hear me chant. Screen. Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm from the uh, call committee, and I have. You can't use this screen yet, but you will be seeing this in the next few, well, next month actually. Um, you'll be getting a an email, and you'll also be getting something in the mail that will look like this. So this is just the precursor of, the, of what you'll be getting, and. It will have a QR code, and if you're familiar with QR codes, you just take a picture of it, and you can get to the survey that we're gonna ask you to fill out. Um, go to the next screen, please. Now, you can't see this, you know, try to make it big enough, but basically the survey that we're gonna ask you to fill out, and I'll be doing announcements each week, so I'll give you just a little piece of information each week about this survey that we're going to send out. Uh, but basically it has questions that we'll be asking you to uh, answer about our congregation so that we can uh, get an idea of where we are. Um, basically for the pastor that's going to be coming in, um, it's all part of Revitality, which is a Lutheran church uh, program to revitalize uh, the churches um, so that we can help our church to um, know where, where to go, what to do to help our church. Um, and the questions are in adaptability, community, family, hospitality, inactives, like how do we serve our inactive members, um, incorporation, how well we help our members get involved in our ministries, outreach, community, how well we get along with our overall morale of our church, uh, viability, how confident we are about being able to continue our ministry, uh, vision, how strong our sense of our mission and purpose is. So a lot of things, uh, the questions that you'll have, and there are a lot of questions, there's 95 of them, um, but I didn't say that yet. Um, but, so it will take a little bit of time, so each week I'll tell you a little bit more about that, um, so I'm going to stop right now and let Faith talk, but expect that to come November 12th. Okay. So we have a few things coming up. 
Uh, for the seventh and eighth graders, this is for you. We're doing Reach once again this next weekend, the 28th, at the Oxford Valley Mall. Uh, Lynn Holmes is going to be leading it because something came up, so be excited for that. Um, <laughs> hope to see you there. This is one of our ways that we're trying to build community, so please make an effort to be there. If you can, invite your friends. Everyone is welcome. Uh, one more thing is we are starting a three, four, five club. So it'll be third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, and we're including the sixth, sixth graders so they don't get lost in the gap. We are going to be doing this once a quarter where we all meet together, third, third through sixth graders, and we're gonna play games, we're gonna do a little bit of Bible study, and we're gonna have some snacks. So this week, or this quarter, I guess, will be Survivor. So everybody will be on a team, and we're gonna do some minute to win a games and see what team can be the sole survivor. So fifth, third through sixth graders, invite your friends to that. Uh, make sure we have um, all the friends there so we can build up this, this community. Thanks. to piggyback a little bit on the pastor's sermon where he said that prayer meetings are almost virtually extinct now and invite you to the um, a prayer service that will be held by zoom on november 5th two o'clock in the afternoon on a sunday and it's part of a the lutheran women's missionary link philadelphia zone so there will be more information in your bulletin next Sunday and the Sunday of the prayer meeting. So look for that. Thank you. Last one. <clears throat> On Friday evening, Hope posted our first, with help of faith, our first international, international chili cook-off. And uh, if you missed it, it was quite an event. There was a number of uh, winners. <clears throat> I'll mention them, David Barker, uh, Cassandra, uh, Angela, uh, Phil, our, our, our vicar, and uh, Lauren Hilbert. Um, David won overall best chili. Uh, Cassandra was most unique. Uh, Phil was the spiciest. And Lauren Hilbert was um, best no meat. So if you run into any of these people in the hallway or, or socially around and they ask you over for dinner, know that especially if it's chilly know that it's going to be very good except pastor vicar you know the, the vicar uh we admire a little spicy so bring it down so. thank you very much oh plan on next year working on your your chili recipes because we expect that to do it again all right and nobody told me about <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's chili recipe okay hopefully one final announcement in your bulletin is an answer and it's the long promised uh, collection for Orphan Dream Train coming up uh, on, uh, well, starting about Saturday. And uh, we'll be uh, probably set up maybe even on Friday, but uh, we'll be going until November 10. There's a list of things that uh, we can use and we'll use to share with others. And uh, as you note, the uh, theme of Orphan Dream Train on the bottom Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Your gifts are Jesus coming to you. And one last one. I want to thank the young man for being accolade today. You did a good job. Please rise for our closing hymn, uh, number 500. I love this one. Number 500 in the blue hymnal. Mm -hmm.